My name is James Sickham, as it says here. Uh, I've been doing PHP for about 13, 14-ish years now. I'm a Zen certified engineer, because um, we like doing exams, uh, as we heard this morning. Um, I work for a company called Rove. Um, at the moment, uh, we do sort of various contracts uh, around the world, and um, uh, apparently we've been described as like uh, a SWAT team that comes in and saves projects. Not my words. Um, I also run the PHP Hampshire user group, which is down on the south coast. So if you're in the area and you haven't heard of PHP Hampshire, where have you been? Come along, please. Um, it's a good fun. I also run the PHP South Coast Conference. Um, more on that in just a sec. Um, and I do, obviously, open source stuff. Um, I do a library called Better Reflection, and also um, uh, the Browser Capabilities Project, which is like a big ini file database of uh, user agents matching. So, yes, a quick plug about the PHP South Coast Conference. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming to the talk. If you'd like to the, come to the conference, um, the next 20 people to buy a ticket using this code will receive a £10 discount. So just by coming to this talk, you're already quids in. So on with the talk. We're going to dip our toes into the sea of security. Oh, actually, before I mention, I should probably explain why I have an eye patch. So the other day, um, I was doing some work in my loft, and I got a corneal abrasion, um, and then everyone said I should wear an eye patch. So here it is. Thank you, Geordie. Anyway, the talk. Yes. Um, so, hands up if you think that this code is reasonably secure. No hands. Can anyone tell me why? Like, just shout as loud as you can. I'll repeat it uh, for the video. So you all don't think it's secure, but no one knows why. OK, that's fine. Um, we can't 100% guarantee this code is secure. I mean, it's written fairly well, you know. Um, there could be holes picked in it, of course. Um, but then, what about if uh, the, the value in A or B was an arbitrarily huge number or contained a load of arbitrarily uh, random data that had weird characters that did weird things? Um, some things are out of our direct control. So, for example, you know, we run PHP, but we don't have necessarily have quick direct access to be able to fix a security bug in PHP itself. Uh, I mean, obviously, you can download the source code, you can fix the bug yourself if you know how to uh, repatch it and then deploy it to your servers. But that's a lot of effort, and if your company's burning right now, that's uh, that's quite a tall order. And also, we run everything on Apache. Um, or Nginx, you know, or any other web server that's available. Um, you take your pick. Um, and then also we run things on Linux, usually, sometimes Windows servers, um, you know, maybe the occasional um, OS X server. But you know, it's even harder to patch things then. And they're out of our direct control. And the point I'm making for this talk um, and uh, if any of you, uh, did any of you see Thomas's uh, security talk earlier today? Okay, a fair few of you. Um, so you'll probably have learned from that that security is a really hard thing, and that's a message I reinforce in my talk quite a lot as well. So we're going to have a look out to sea, and I am going to take my eye patch off now because it's kind of annoying. I can see half the room now. Hello, everyone. <laughs> All right, we're going to look out to sea because there's a lot of ocean out there, and there's a lot of things to know. This, by the way, is the south coast in Portsmouth. We have a stony beach. It does help to know the big things, though, right? So that's what I'm going to talk you through today. Um, and you're probably going to know some of the stuff in here. I hope you do. Um, but it does not hurt to get reminded that you should always be trying to practice secure web application development when you can. Well, not when you can, all the time. It's the whole point, right? So I invented these golden rules. They're sort of made up, um, but they're rules that I develop by um, from making mistakes and learning the things the hard way sometimes. Um, I, like most of you, I think maybe all of you, uh, are human. And as we learned from the keynote yesterday, you know, we all make, uh, make mistakes. It does happen, unfortunately. So first one. Keep things simple. 
Don't overthink problems. Um, it sounds simpler uh, to say than it is to actually do. But when you're writing an application um, and you're thinking, oh, let's make this uh, new feature and we start plumbing in things and the feature creep goes up and up and up, um, not only is that obviously creating feature creep, which I think most of us know is, is fairly difficult to manage, um, it also overcomplicates and creates more security vectors, more security attack vectors. Um, when you're looking at code as well, simpler code is much easier to read and understand what is going on. Um, if you don't know what's going on, and there's just this mess of code, how are you supposed to identify security vulnerabilities here? So my advice is to start off as simple as you can, and then add complexity later in small bits. Right? Start off simple, and try and keep it simple, but if you need that extra functionality, do it in small bits, and test it, of course. Knowing the risks is number two. Keeping up to date with security news. Um, you know, pretty much every month, uh, multiple um, uh, CVEs, uh, or common vulnerabilities and exposures, uh, they're basically like bug reports, but security reports, if you've never heard of them, are found in PHP. You know, loads, all the time. So we have to be able to keep up to date with these things. Um, quite a common way of doing this is just social media, right? Um, you know, you've probably all heard of Poodle and Heartbeat and Heartbleed and Shellshock and things like that. And you've probably heard of those through Twitter or, you know, via word of mouth and things like that. But getting involved in your community and keeping in touch with the community, coming to events like this and talking to fellow developers, going to your local user group, you know, you'll probably hear about security vulnerabilities, or at least the major ones. Uh, because they'll be, you know, the talk of the talk of the day. I mentioned, of course, common vulnerabilities and exposures, or CVEs. It's basically a big database. Um, and if you're ever unsure, oh, I'm not sure if you know PHP or Apache has any vulnerabilities in my current version. You can just type in the package name and the version that you have, and it will tell you what's there. So the next one is fail security, uh, fail securely. Sorry. Now, I'll use a real-world example to explain this one. There's lots of red lights going off. That doesn't look good. Um, so a real-world example here is an electric door lock, right? And the power goes out. Failing safely is where the door has a manual override that will allow you to you know, still exit or enter through that door uh, if the power goes out. Now, failing securely, is where that lock stays shut. It doesn't move. Obviously, it can't move because there's no power. Um, so you can't get in or out. Now, imagine if you're in a pub, right? And this pub had this electric lock on the front. You'd probably want that lock to fail safely. You still want to be able to get out when time's up, uh, or at least the, the landlord probably wants you to get out when time's up, um, and be able to go home. But Imagine if that lock was on a prison. You'd probably want that to fail securely, because you don't want all the prisoners getting out. Now, imagine, on it's a room that, uh, imagine that lock is on a room that contains your credit card details. You know? I think you can see where I'm going with this, is use failing safely versus failing securely appropriately. Don't always fail securely. You might not need to, but Use your, uh, use your judgment there. So number four is don't reinvent the wheel. Now, as I've said already, security is a really hard, uh, hard thing to do right and get right every single time. Um, so let the experts do the work or the hard work. So for example, if you wanted uh, to write some encryption into your application, you know, don't go off and write your own encryption library. Use a package that does it for you. Use libraries that already exist, because they've probably uh, been much more vetted than your code that you've, that you've written has been. So yeah. Number five, never trust anything or anyone. Never trust your input for your application. Hopefully, we know this one. Never trust your database records, because although they may have already been through your application, 
There's no guarantee that somehow some access has gotten, uh, someone's gotten access to the database outside of your application and has put in some duff data. So don't trust your users either. Obviously, they're the ones putting the input in. And increasingly, and it pains me to say it, you may not even be able to trust the people that work your, at your own company. There may be a disgruntled employee who got the sack today who's now walked off with your code base. And this has happened. Um, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Yahoo or Yandex or something like that recently had uh, a, a news report saying that you know, that all their code base was stolen. You know, so it does happen, and it's rubbish. I hope, I hope we can stamp that out fairly quick. So yeah, your colleagues. Don't trust your spouse. Oh, wait, not that one, not that one. Oops. All right. So um, if you're at Thomas's talk, you'll have heard about this. Um, the OWASP, or Open Web Application Security Project, uh, it was created in 2001. It's a not-for-profit, non-biased um, organization that does security advice and sort of uh, recommendations. Doesn't recommend specific services, uh, you know, specific services or anything like that. Um, they're not affiliated with any uh, corporation, so you're getting impartial advice here. Now, they have this thing called the OWASP Top 10, if you don't know, and it's basically uh, the top 10 list of uh, vulnerabilities found in the wild, uh, ordered by you know how how uh, how commonly they occur. I'm not going to list all of them, but you'll see on some of my slides I've got like number one or number three or whatever, uh, and that's where they are in the top ten list. And you know, they're there for a good reason. So the first part of my talk is going to be about application security, and I'm going to do a little bit at the end about um, uh, Linux server security, again from lessons that I've learned. So. As I said, don't trust anything, uh, so you should always filter input and escape output. Very simple. Always remember that one. That's like a, um, uh, uh, the canonical advice for security when writing a web application. And that includes APIs and outputting JSON and stuff, right? Not just HTML. So the C theme for this talk uh, is mostly based around the Disney film Finding Nemo, so you'll see lots of screenshots like this. Um, and this is the number one uh, uh, on the OWASP top 10 list, and it is uh, SQL injection. Uh, it's like a big great white shark. Pretty scary villain in the uh, film, right? <clears throat> um, it's vicious, uncompromising, and has sharp teeth. And it's number one for a reason, because someone somewhere is still doing this. Um, yeah, so hopefully you've heard of Little Bobby Tables. It's a, an XKCD comic that explains SQL injection. Um, you know, we, uh, we have a phone call from um, the school, and um, they're saying, well, all of our users are gone, and that's because they named their, uh, their son uh, Robert, uh, apostrophe, drop table students, and so on. And they've managed to drop all the, uh, all the students' tables. So the way to get around this is, of course, use PDO if you're not using it already. Uh, hopefully, most of you now are, because MySQL extension is, is, has been deprecated for a while, and it's now gone in PHP 7. So if you've upgraded to PHP 7 and you were still using MySQL, you probably will have got a bit of a surprise. Um, use prepared or parameterized uh, statements, whichever you want to call it. And yes, um, for many of us, this is basic stuff. But you do need to know this and remember it all the time, because sometimes you may be you know, coding late at night or early in the morning whenever you prefer to, and you might feel a bit lazy because you're just prototyping stuff. And you know, a vulnerability uh, slips in very easily. And of course, you can use libraries, Doctrine, um, the one that comes with Laravel, you know, all these other frameworks um, have database abstraction layers that do this for you. So use them. This is what not to do. Don't use um, you know, your own homegrown database abstraction layer that doesn't escape anything very well. Um, and just write something directly from the query string into, um, uh, into uh, your SQL query. Do it like this. Use prepared statements. Yeah. Um, it's also 
better to turn off emulated prepared statements um, if, uh, if that is on in your setup, um, just because then it will use the capabilities of the engine, uh, the, the database engine, as much as possible. So it makes it a bit safer. All right, on to the next one. This is a human, um, but there's something uh, very unhuman about what follows. So I did a search on GitHub last night for this, and it came up with five, seven, uh, 573,363 results for executing code directly from a get query string. Oh, it's so frustrating to see something like this. And I hope every single one of those 573,000-odd are just academic examples of what not to do. Because if they're not, and I have a sneaky suspicion that they're not, then this is a big catalog of vulnerabilities. And the same thing with eval. 572,000 results uh, evaluating code directly from the query string. Don't use eval unless you know exactly what you're doing and you know how to do it properly. Um, just don't do it. No, it's better not to. So the next vulnerability is cross-site scripting, um, or XSS, as it's uh, usually known as, because we like acronyms. Um, this is the number three on the OWASP top 10, and they're a bit like jellyfish. And the reason why I'd say that is because they can sometimes be hard to see, but they are actually very easy to avoid. Um, you just swim away from them. Um, and XSS is the result of not escaping output. So you know, going back to what I said a minute ago, filter input, escape output. And the solution is very simple. Um, if you have uh, some JavaScript and a string, doesn't matter how it got there, so for some, you know, maybe some user input or something, if you just echo that, the JavaScript's going to run in the browser. So then you know, they can upload your cookies, whatever might be uh, uh, the latest JavaScript style attack. Um, and if you simply escape it, that JavaScript won't run. It's as simple as that. Um, tools, frameworks, libraries, and things like that, they, I hope, I'm pretty sure they've all got tools built in to do that. Um, you know, Zenview, Twig, Plates, they all have escaping stuff, so make sure you're using it. Um, you know, if it's not on by default, like Zen, uh, Zenview, you have to manually type escape HTML all the time, which is a bit of a pain. I have to say, um, but make sure you do use it. So this next one, unfortunately, I couldn't find a Finding Nemo image uh, for a cuttlefish. Um, but a cross-site request forgery uh, links up to a cuttlefish because uh, a cuttlefish is the chameleon of the sea, so it can sort of blend into its background. And the reason why I say that is because uh, a CSRF attack is basically a forged HTTP request from somewhere else on the internet. Um, so someone pretending to be they're not what they're not. So the way to overcome a CSRF attack is a little bit more complicated than just escaping output, uh, but it's still pretty simple, right? So what we do is we generate a token on the server. Um, we write it out with our form, uh, if we're writing HTML, obviously. Um, and then when they submit the form, verify that the token that was stored in session is the same one that uh, you know, comes through on the form submission. If it doesn't match, then you know, it's not from your own form. They can't guess that, that, uh, that randomly generated string. Sometimes they might be able to, but we'll see. And all the good frameworks, again, they have tools that allow you to do this very easily. Um, I imagine Symfony Form does, Zenform definitely does, and it's Super simple, you just add a CSRF field. It does all the hard work for you. Now, I just want to point out a couple of things about this code example. Um, note here that we're using this function called random bytes. Um, if you're not aware of all the new stuff in PHP 7, uh, this is one of them. And if you don't have PHP 7 yet, uh, there's actually obviously a, a polyfill, a backwards compatibility thing that allows you to use this right now in, in PHP less than PHP 7 version uh, of applications. And this is a much better way of generating random stuff. So make sure you use it. Before, when I gave this talk, this was, that was using MT Rand, which is not great. And it also doesn't work on F uh, PHP FPM, apparently, or doesn't work great 
in some instances. Also, I want to point out that we're not using the equals comparison operator here, or the exact or identical triple equals here. And the reason why we're using hash equals is because this prevents against a timing attack. So this bit of C code here is um, the is I, Zend is identical uh, function within PHP. Um, and it's basically how it does string comparisons, or value comparisons, rather. So first up, the ZP macro, will uh, the comparison there checks to see if they're exactly the same you know, variable um, within the code. You know, it's like saying if $foo equals $foo. Well, yes, it does, because they're the same thing. Um, and then the next part is ZStrlengp uh, will check to see if the length of the string is exactly the same. So the last bit we'll get on to in a minute. So I screwed up my slides there. There we go. So a timing attack. Um, the first step in attacking this is to figure out the length, which is very, very easy to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to try a different length of string each time. And we're going to do this thousands of times. Yeah? And the correct length of string will be minutely uh, longer. The request will take very slightly longer. So if we just put in one character, it might be, for example, say 0.001 seconds. And then if we put in AA, it might be the same. And we keep going up and up and up. And obviously, we, from looking at the slide, we know it's six characters. And we can see that AAAAA will take 0 0.00002 seconds. And then all the other lengths will take the same as before. Now, obviously, this is very made up numbers. You know, these aren't real world numbers. But it's roughly like that. And that indication there, the request time being slightly different when we've got the string length exactly right is how you leak the length of your, uh, your strings. So the last bit of uh, the identical comparison is the memcmp function. It compares two bits of stuff. And the way this works, uh, if you're not familiar with C, is it will loop over each character in the string. And as soon as it finds a character that is not equal, it will return. Otherwise, it proceeds to the next character. So we can use a timing attack for this. Say we do the same thing again. We try each string thousands of times. Um, so say we try A. It takes an average of 0 0.001 seconds. Um, and then we try B. That's not quite right. It's going to take the same. We keep going until we get to F where it will become 0.002 seconds. It's the same concept as we just did. Because it takes slightly longer because it's gone on to the next, uh, next iteration of the loop. You know? And it's very minute changes here. But you do it over an average of a lot of requests. And then the next letter, we try A and B and so on, and it's still not working until we get to the right letter, O, where it takes very slightly longer. So we keep doing this over and over again, and over and over again, uh, with lots and lots of requests. Um, yeah, it's, it's not sometimes practical. You know, if you've built in good security measures to um, you know, mitigate brute force attacks and stuff, you know, say after 10 requests within um, you know, two minutes or something, then block the IP or something, you know, that's not going to work so well. But there are cases where this could work. So. Sensitive data exposure. Um, this little fishy here is an anglerfish. Um, and you know, it gives the game away with this big light on its head. Um, and this is the number six on the OWASP top 10. And it's basically doing stuff like this. Um, you know, forgetting to leave um, you know, your error handling, uh, displaying errors uh, on your web pages. You know, PHP's had a reputation for looking a bit like that. Um, obviously, this is my development service, server, so I've got xDebug, and that's what makes it orange. But you know, we've seen screenshots of websites with 
PHP could not connect to database and stuff all over it. My advice there is make sure you turn off displaying errors. Use a proper logging library, something like Monolog, um, to log your errors and be alerted to them. Have a good logging system. Um, stuff like New Relic, maybe. Um, but yeah, filter out what the end user sees. And it, just doesn't, it doesn't just apply to HTML as well. As I mentioned earlier, you, know, you need to escape the stuff that's going into your JSON. So you don't want to, just because it's an, an API, you think, oh, it's only a machine reading that. A human's never going to read that. Well, they do. You know, when we're writing an API, you know, we'll, we'll often make a manual request for Postman or you know, whatever your favorite REST, uh, REST client is. And we'll see that data. Hackers can see them too. And also consider your headers as well. Now, this is my dev box, so don't worry too much, um, unless you're hacking it right now. Um, but you know, here, we can see that the server is Apache 2.4.10. So all I need to do as a hacker is head over to cvdetails.com, enter Apache HTTP server 2.4.10. Oh, look, there's three vulnerabilities. Let's exploit them. You know, sometimes they're not very easy, sometimes they're difficult, but you know, that kind of information exposure makes it easier. It, you know, it lowers the barrier of, um, uh, of hacking things. So this next one is a barracuda. It's a big fish with sharp teeth. Um, and this represents a man in the middle attack, if you like. I don't know why, just for fun. Um, don't do this. Um, if you're using curl directly, um, consider something like Guzzle or you know, a library that's done all this for you. Um, but doing this renders HTTPS with curl almost pointless. And I've done this, you know, as you know, my years, uh, you know, as I learn things, you know, I was just like, oh, well, that's that's easy, you know, but just turn off that that check. But it's it's bad, you know. And the reason why is because we're not verifying. Anything is genuine. Yes, the, the connection's encrypted, but we don't know who we're actually connected to. It could be anyone. It's just encrypted. And that's the whole point of HTTPS. So the correct way of doing things is to obtain, obtain a uh, PEM certific certificate from the genuine server. You can do that just by hitting it with a web browser and download the certificate. It's very simple. Put it on your server. Obviously, verify that that's the right certificate first. Um, and then point curl at it. Verify host two means it checks the common name um, matches the host name and things like that. So we're doing a, a couple of extra checks. So we have a, a, a load of seagulls here gathering numbers. And they're all squawking and contributing and all writing third party code. Now, Many times, I've already said, you know, use a library that's done it before. But that comes with a warning, because um, you know, these sort of libraries and plugins and code you copy and paste it from Stack Overflow or you know, some PHP tutorial from 1999, um, you know, they may not be particularly secure. They may not be written with security in mind. So when you just blindly copy and paste that code in, or you require it with Composer, or anything like that, um, you, know, you may not be having secure code included in your application. So the ideal advice I'd give here is to audit every single piece of code, you know, every single composer dependency in your application. That's not always practical. If you're using you know, Zen Framework, Symfony, Laravel, and so on, are you really going to go through every single line of code and check that it's as secure as it can be? It's not always practical. You can use something like Rove Security Advisories, little plug here. It uses info um, from a repository called Friends of PHP Security Advisories um, to basically bo block composer installation of known insecure packages. So you know, it's as simple as composer require that library. Um, it's not fully comprehensive, but it will help you know, eliminate the big, the big issues right? that are known so my pragmatic advice with regards to third-party code libraries you know, pulled in from Composer is I suppose we can only put our trust in safety in numbers. You know? 
package Y has 10 million users. If there's a security vulnerability in there, it's going to apply to 10 other million users. You know? um, so we're all in the same boat. Honestly, I don't think there's any great other advice for it, um, you know, unless you go through and you're a security expert and you go and order every single package, which is you know, the rate at which we developers write code. There's no way we can order that much code. So we're all security experts now, right? Ah, not quite. There is a lot to remember. And yes, we're not all security experts, but we can try and do the best we can. We can try and write as secure code as possible. Use the techniques that I've explained so far. Um, you know, keep learning more about it. It can be, you know, some people might find security and sort of learning a bit more about it quite an interesting topic. I think it is. That's why I'm up here doing a talk about it. Keep it simple, you know. I keep saying it over and over again, yeah. Keep your application simple because reasons I've said it already. Maybe even hire a pen tester or something like that. There's, there's, there's companies and, and, and consultants that you can hire who will go through your code um, or maybe you know, try and hack your code and things like that. But maybe your company can't afford it or won't, won't pay for it because they don't recognize the importance of security, which does happen. You know? So maybe we could try and hack our own system. You know? Find um, vulnerabilities in your own system. Well, how do you find vulnerabilities in your system? Well, you need to think like a hacker. You need to think how they would. You need to be the threat. First of all, what do you want? You know, if you're working um, you know, at a health insurance company, right? You've got a lot of personal data. You've got names, addresses, dates of birth, medical um, history, and things like that saved in your database. So maybe someone that's hacking uh, this health insurance company that you work for wants that information. Maybe you collect payments from your customers via direct debit. So maybe they might be after bank details or credit card details. Don't store them. Use a payment provider. Um, or maybe you just want to cause downtime. Maybe uh, this uh, health insurance company you work for, maybe the, the CEO is a racist homophobe or something, and then an activist hacker group will then want to just sort of take this company down because they disagree with it politically, you know, whatever. There's all sorts of reasons why you might want to hack someone. So you need to think like them. You say, right, well, I need to access this or try and access something, you know? So how do you get it? Well, I've just explained a load of vulnerabilities to you, right? There's the whole of the OWASP top 10 is, you know, a good place to start, right? Okay, is my website vulnerable to SQL injection? Oh, yes, it is. Oops. Um, yeah, all the other OWASP top 10. The CVEs database. As I've said, you know, maybe you don't know what version of Apache or Nginx they're running, but you can still look up Apache and Nginx if you know they're running it. Or maybe you don't know they're running it, just try anyway. You could try and gain elevated privileges. So it's where you might have a, a you know, normal user's login for a website, and then you try and you know, gain pseudo access or something like that. Also, session hijacking. You know, everyone talks about it a lot. It's, you know, it's where you become someone else's session, essentially. Um, the con con vul vul vulnerability database, I mentioned that one. Um, more complex stuff, as I've said, like timing attacks. You know, that can be difficult to pull off, but it might work. You never know. But try and think outside the box as well. As developers, you know, we're, at, we're sitting there writing the application. We know how it's supposed to work. But the way you hack a system is not by doing things the way you're supposed to work. It's by doing things the way they're not supposed to work and we forgot to think about them. So maybe when you're writing some uh, new feature and you want it to be uh, uh, you know, audited, get together with your team or maybe a, you know, a friend if you uh, work on your own um, and you know, review the code together. And they might have some other ideas about how things could be hacked. 
or done better, you know? Peer reviewing code is, is great. And looking out for security vulnerabilities should be one of the things that you look out for when doing code reviews and things like that. Think about beyond your stack as well. Are you using CentOS 3. Point whatever from the 20s? I don't know. You might be. Maybe uh, your sysadmin doesn't really think that it's worth upgrading because everything will break. But by now, you know, that CentOS 3 from the 20s might be completely vulnerable with, filled with vulnerabilities. That's a reason to upgrade in itself. So, you've gone through your application or, you know, your feature, whatever you're doing, or whatever you're auditing, and uh, you've got a whole load of stuff. Right, there's like a hundred things. So we need to do what's called a risk assessment or a threat modeling um, thing. That sounds very corporate-y and stuff like that, but it's actually very logical, and I'll quickly show you through it. The way we do this is we assess the risk of each one using this um, DREAD acronym. Unfortunately, spelled slightly differently to judge DREAD, but... But yeah, you give each one of these a score out of 10, which we'll go through in a moment, and then you rank them in, an order, in order of importance. So the first one is the damage. How much damage could someone do if they you know, accessed your system? Maybe they would be able to access uh, your IP address logs. It's debatable how much damage you can do with that. I mean, it's, it's some sort of a personal information, debatable. But they may go through those and just say, well, I could, I don't know, I could report all of these IPs for something to their ISP and say, you know, well, this subscriber's been naughty. And then all your users are suddenly getting emails from the, or letters from their ISP saying, you've been doing something naughty. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, it's just a bit of a pain in the neck, really. But maybe they accessed your stored list of credit card details. Again, don't store credit card details, but maybe they did. Um, reproducibility. How easy is it to reproduce this issue? Um, you know, do you need to be logged in first to exploit this? Or is it a you know, very simple, unauthorized HTTP request to some URL? You know, that sort of thing is very reproducible, because you just hit it in a browser. Job done. Or maybe you know, it requires logging into the website first, you know, enabling cookies in whatever you're doing, uh, gaining pseudo access, and then you have to go to this page and you know, open this link, and you have to have two sessions open at once, whatever, whatever. That's not very reproducible. So that would score a low, low score. Especially if random chance is involved. You know, say this vulnerability is only there every 325 requests. Yeah. It's a bit weird. Who writes code like that? Probably all of us. Um, social engineering, that's a whole other kettle of fish. Um, you know, depending on you know, your, your charisma score, you may be good at social engineering. Um, yeah, I'm not great at social engineering myself, probably. I've never tried it. Um, maybe I should. We'll see. Exploitability, now this is sort of similar, but this is basically how easy is it to exploit the whole. You know, what tools do you need to do it? Do you just need a web browser, or do you need to have like a really low-level understanding of how the Linux kernel network layer or something works? Or maybe you need detailed knowledge about the infrastructure of the, the company that you're uh, trying to attack, and maybe you don't have that information, or maybe you do. You know? The number of affected users is obviously very important as well. So, you know, if you're maybe like Sony or something, that's quite a lot of users, you know, 77 million. That's a lot of affected users. Maybe it's just one user. You know, maybe you can gain access to someone's account. You know, if you're a, a customer-centric company, that could be quite important because you know, that user might be Stephen Fry and he might go and complain on Twitter. I won't know, he won't. Never mind. Um, but also consider the type of the user. You know? If he's the CEO of a multinational corporation that controls billions of pounds, you know, they've got a lot of power. If you can access his email inbox, you're off to a great start. Finally, discoverability. 
How easy is it to find out about this exploit? Is there a link to the exploit on the company's homepage? That would be a bit silly to do, but maybe there is. Um, you know, do you need to have a security badge for physical access to the company so that you can log in with a USB stick and uh, gain access that way? Obviously, that's not very discoverable. You know, how many people um, have access to you know, that sort of USB stick? You have to go through a registration process. It's probably doable, but it's not very discoverable. You have to know things. And also, it's worth mentioning about security through obscurity. That's not enough. I know from experience. Let's leave it at that. So once you've got all these scores out of 10 for each one of these criteria, add them up and rank them in order. And then fix them. It's as simple as that. Um, you know, if you need to get sign off on these issues, all you need to do is go to your boss and say, this is a list of all our really critical 10 out of 10 for each, uh, each letter. You know, they're very vulnerable. You know, we're very vulnerable right now. You'd probably be surprised how you know, that list comes out, maybe. So I'm going to talk a little bit about authentication and authorization here. So authentication is verifying identity, verifying who you are. Am I James Titcombe? Can any of you prove that? I might not be. Um, so when I log, log onto a website, usually I'll use a password. That's a very common uh, way of logging to a web website. If you work in a corporation, maybe you log in with you know, LDAP or Active Directory, you know, a delegated password, that is called. More and more websites are adopting one-time codes or two-factor authentication or whatever they want to call it, basically logging on with an SMS message or an email or YubiKey, Google two-factor authentication, all these methods. Um, and that's a good way of doing things. And the reason why, if you're not already aware about two-factor authentication, is because you've got two things. You log in with your password, which is something you know, which the hacker can probably figure out, you know, if you've got a password one as your password. Um, but also something that you possess. So maybe your phone. That's where I keep my phone. Um, and uh, you know, or your YubiKey, or your bank's login token, things like that. It's something you physically possess. So if you've got a remote hacker in China or Russia or somewhere, doesn't matter where, um, the hacker doesn't have physical access to that device. Now, there's probably ways of figuring it out. You could probably figure out what kind of device they have, and maybe if you've got access to the database, there is their you know, two-factor authentication starter seed key or whatever you want to call it. So maybe it's still exploitable, but it's a lot more difficult. Also, you could log in with biometrics. That's maybe less common. Fingerprints, iris recognition, maybe even DNA recognition if you're being super secure. Um, but then if you have a uh, twin brother or sister, then that may not work so well. Um, but a, a more realistic or pragmatic way uh, is probably logging in with you know, key cards, USB sticks. Um, and that's sort of similar to the way two-factor authentication works, but maybe it may be the only factor that you log in with. So you log in with a USB stick, and it just logs in. So that's only one factor. So custom authentication. So we thought about doing something like this before. Um, it was a single sign-on across you know, all of our web properties. So you know, you'd be able to log in. They were on different domains, so we couldn't just use cookies and things like that. So we'd make a request, we'd proxy to an authentication server, it'd validify, va validate the identity, blah, 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 blah. And then we decided not to do it. We decided to keep it simple. And it's one of the golden rules, as I've said. All that complexity that we, start with, we thought about introducing Introduce huge potential attack vectors. And none of us were secure enough or you know, knew enough about security to categorically turn around and say, no, that will definitely be secure. I wouldn't trust myself. So we sacrificed that small amount of usability, you know, being able to log on to all of those web domains all at once for a big security gain. 
Password hashing, use password hash. Hopefully it goes without saying now. Never use plain text, never use MD5, never use encryption. Don't encrypt password, hash them. Uh, if you don't yet have PHP 5.5 or above, um, there is backwards compatibility library that you can use, so you can use password hash straight away. There's no reason not to. It's done in a way that means, uh, as long as you don't try and provide your own salt um, in some weird, unsecure way, then you're doing it the right way. Authorization is, is not verifying your identity, it's verifying what your identity can access. Now, you can check auth or uh, you should be checking for authorization in your service level rather than your controllers. And the reason for this is, if you have a service that deletes a blog post, for example, and you have a controller that uses, uh, uh, uses that service to delete a blog post, and then you create a new endpoint, uh, API endpoint, you may forget to do the authentication. So the best place to do it is back here, where you do the deletion of the blog post, and you say, can whoever is logged on delete this blog post. There's various types of authorization. ACL, RBAC, you know, they're the most common ones. There's also attribute-based, like um, XACML and things like that. They're a bit more enterprisey and complicated, but yeah, there's various ways of doing it. Cryptography is hard. This guy knows. If you don't know who that is, that's Alan Turing. Um, and that statue is just down the road from the PHP Northwest Conference venue. Um, you can sit next to him if you like. It's not the real Alan Turing, it's just a statue. But yeah, never roll your own cryptography. Um, ever. Simple. Unless you're like super security expert, which I wouldn't say I am the super security expert. I wouldn't write my own encryption uh, and use it in a production application. I might do it um, you know, as an academic example to learn about encryption. That's fine. Yeah, you could do that. And then you could um, you know, ask someone on the internet, try and hack this, and they'll probably do it in like five minutes because they've thought about an attack vector that you had no idea about. Yeah? So, James, how should I encrypt things? I hear you ask. He's got some ideas. <laughs> No, don't listen to this guy. Um, evidently, he knows not very much about encryption. Well, you should use something called libsodium. Now, mcrypt is pretty much abandoned. There's been very few commits uh, you know, over the last few years to mcrypt, which is probably the go-to package for many of us. But there's this new thing called libsodium, and there's a peckle package which will allow you to do it, and it's trying to do things in a more secure, you know, the right way. So if you want to do some encryption for you know, your application, maybe you need to store something very securely, um, not credit card details, please, um, try this one out. I mentioned I'm going to do a couple minutes on Linux server security. Why is this important? Um, well, as per the hacking your own system uh, stuff, you need to care about the whole system, not just your application. Um, you know, maybe. Not, uh, you know, not just your company stuff either. Maybe your dev box is out there on uh, you know, some VPS provider, and maybe you didn't really put much thought into securing that. Maybe you should. Create an SSH fortress, right? Log in always with passwordless SSH. Once you've set that up, disable the ability to log in with a password. That will flummox most automated um, you know, brute force SSH hackers. Um, disable the root user so you can't log in directly with root. Always use sudo. That's becoming the norm on distributions these days, which is good. And you don't need to revert it. You don't need to log in with root. Just use sudo. Lock it down by IP address, perhaps. Maybe you know, uh, you know, you have a static IP address at home, and you have a VPN that allows you to access your company's um, uh, you know, web uh, servers and things. Um, so lock it down to those IP addresses. You know, <laughs> then pretty much no one else except if they're at your house or you know, they've logged into their VPN uh, will access it. Maybe even run SSH on a different port, but that's a bit like security through obscurity. Run a firewall 
Um, you know, open, only open up specific ports that you know you need. Where, uh, you know, 80, 443, and 25 if you're running a mail server, and one, uh, 110, and things like that. And drop all the other traffic. Maybe you could use IP tables. Don't worry, you're not supposed to be able to read that. It's very complicated. So maybe try uncomplicated firewall instead. That roughly does the same thing as that, the last screen, um, but in three lines of code. It's not 100% equivalent, but it does the job. And as a starting point, this is great. It's easy, right? So you also need to be able to mitigate brute force attacks. You know, many, of, many servers will you know, be, undergo brute force attacks even if you don't think that you're vulnerable because it's only me, it's only my little dev box on uh, DigitalOcean or Linode or something, um, and no one's going to attack that, what, what could they possibly want? But it's not someone doing it, it's just a bot script that goes through and tries hundreds of thousands of passwords. You can mitigate that with something like fail to ban, which is a package which analyzes the logs on your server and bans someone who keeps trying to log in over and over again and fails to log in. Only install what you need, and regularly audit what you have installed on your servers. I know this the hard way, and I'll show you in a sec. Um, you know, don't install Cruft and leave it lying around. The less packages you have installed, the, um, the easier it is for you to manage as well. Right? So for example, this is our last little sea creature, or second to last, actually. Um, this last sea creature, or second to last, I just said that, is a squid. By itself, it's pretty innocent, but when combined with this guy, things get pretty ugly. Um, I installed Squid one day on my uh, VPS and played around with it and then got distracted by something shiny on the internet. And then a couple of weeks later, my VPS provider sent me a support ticket and said, your box is sending lots of spam email. I'm like, it's not. Don't be silly. <laughs> Yes, it was a lot of spam email. And the reason why is because you know, a couple of weeks ago, I had installed Squid and left it completely open to the internet. See, they discovered that because I left it there unconfigured. I very promptly uninstalled it. And that's just how easy it is. You know, distracting by shiny things on the internet is very easy, trust me. So here's a few resources. Take a photo if you need to. Um, I'll also be putting these slides online, so you don't need to take a photo. Securing PHP, um, they have two, book, two books. It's run by uh, a guy called Chris Cornutt, um, who also runs phpdeveloper.org, which has been in my new source for, of PHP for a long time. The OWASP site, of course, I mentioned. Um, Anthony Ferrara, he's the person that wrote the password compatibility library, which is also linked there. Um, and Paragon Initiatives Enterprises, I looked at it and thought, a Paragon Internet Explorer? Um, yeah, that's a, a good source of good security information as well. It's sort of trying to be the best. Um, and they also made the, the random bytes and uh, random number libraries. And also websec.io. Uh, websec um, there's some good resources on there. So the golden rules remind you very quickly before we go. Keep it simple. Know the risks. Fail securely, don't reinvent the wheel, and never trust anything or anyone. If you follow all this, you'll get our last secret creature of the day, a security seal. All right, does anyone have any questions? I think we have time. Yeah. Nothing? Oh, we got one at the back. Hi. Um, Hello. Just, I was just wondering what you think of using stuff like Burp Suite to like batter your application and to sort of find vulnerabilities. Yeah. Yeah. Any tool out there, you know, Siege, whatever. Um, you know, there's there's loads of tools out there. Use them. Absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead and use tools that allow you to hack things and you know maybe automate all this sort of trying things manually. Yeah. Absolutely. Good idea. Thank you. 
Anything else? Okay, um, please um, do rate my talk on Joined In. Uh, there's the link and uh, on all that, or it's on the front page of uh, Joined In, if you just want to click through to it. Um, I would appreciate your feedback in improving this talk for next time, and obviously all the other speakers as well. Thank you very much.